Okay. Hello, everyone. So I think we're going to get started now. Um, it's uh, it's actually about time to, to start. Um, so thanks for thanks for having us today. Uh, it's a pretty good turnout. Um, I'm Sebastian Han. I work as a staff engineer. Where? Where? Oh, I work for Red Hat. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's part of the slides anyway, but yeah, okay. Yeah. I work for Red Hat. Hi, everyone. My name is John Coyne. I also work for Red Hat. I'm a product guy. Um, and I've been doing this with Sebastian so for quite a while. Today, we have the honor to share the stage with a new member of our team, new mem old member on the work side, but new member on stage, uh, Julia Fidenta. Yeah, I work for that as well. And um, I work on the integration of Ceph in uh, OpenStack using Triple, so the our deployment tool for OpenStack in Ceph. All right, so let's get started. So I hope you like the pictures, but I think it basically tells the story. When we started OpenStack, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm uh, one of the pioneers, probably, in, at least in the storage aspect of OpenStack. And uh, this is my 11th summit, believe it or not. Um, we have designed OpenStack to be an open source option of AWS, pretty much, right? Uh, where we thought about the main data center. All right, I'll go back. So we designed OpenStack to be something like an open source version of AWS. We're so looking at the main data centers to service our clouds, right? And the original design of OpenStack was not necessarily to go all the way to the edge. But here we are today in 2018 tr trying to do exactly this, right? And the reason is a lot of change. So we're going to try in the next 40 minutes uh, not just show you what's happening in the current release of Stain, uh, where we're putting the effort and investments as a community, but also where we're going after this uh, summit and pretty much for the next several summits, right? Where, where is going to be a focus area to try to make it happen. So we'll start with a quick reality check, uh, talk about some of the use case, talk about the landscape, talk about 5G and how it changed things. And then we'll go deeper to understand the edge factors. When we talk about edge, guess what? It's a heavy buzzword, heavy used. And it doesn't mean all the same times, all, all the things. So when we, there's, when we say edge, there's one thing to have an edge side and a far edge size the, all the way down to the IoT device. And I can tell you right now, we're not looking at all of the edge use cases, right? <laughs> we're very practical. Uh, we're going to talk about the distributed requirements of edge uh, from the edge factors. 5G, by the way, comes by the standard with the distributed cloud out of the box. And then we're going to talk about where we are today. Sebastian's going to talk where we're doing done. Over the last years, we showed you what we can do together with co-locating Ceph and OpenStack together in a hyper-converged fashion. Today, what we'd like to do is to show you, as we push OpenStack to the far edge, what does it mean for storage, right? Uh, how can we get more... Uh, uh, um, basically put storage in a box closer to the edge and still deal with the image synchronization, data availability, all that stuff, but with lower latency and lower footprint. Um, obviously, we're going to mention containers. Um, we're going to talk about what we're doing in stain release specifically, and then what's the roadmap, as, as I mentioned, for going forward. Um, I want to start with some observation. Um, we started this journey, as I mentioned, OpenStack looking at a cloud, right? But something that happens outside of our walls, open walls, should I say, is like we're getting smarter. And we're getting smarter every year in terms of our capability. In fact, next week on this stage, we're going to have Smart Countries Conference, right? So you, all of you guys are using smartphones, right? We're talking about smart countries already. And this is taking place in, this, in Europe here in Berlin next week. And so it's not just the endpoint devices we're going to care about. It's like how they're going to connect it to the biggest story. If you want to go one layer down, smart cities. Believe it or not, one of the use cases of 5G's networks is smart cities. And if you go back to your, how, the way you got here today, cars. Our cars are getting smarter. At some point, they don't need us anymore, right? You can just enter a car. It's self-driven. We have AI. We have machine learning. It could do it all alone. We have a lot of companies investing now in this capability. As you know, my own car is a hybrid car that I have some of this functionality already. It can drive on its own. Huh. How many of you are don't like to take a car to work and actually bike to work? Raise your hand. Right? The green people. All right. 
Let's do a quick reality check. So we're talking about augmented reality capabilities. This is one of the uses that's coming our way, but we still want to take that journey. And this is the digital transformation journey, right? You heard the keynotes in the morning, some of the segments like we had like digital bank, right? Tr completely online and uh, doing uh, the disruption. But the way we're going to communicate is different. But one of the things I want you to start to adopt in your way of thinking is this bike, regardless of the new capabilities we're going to gain with the new services, are going to, is going to move. The motion is still there. And the way we're going to move from one point to another is going to affect the service and where we're going to get the service. We are in a cloud infrastructure, open cloud infrastructure business. This bike will take me to the next stop where probably can be a natural park. Guess what? There's limited antennas in the area. There's maybe one close point of presence that I'll be connecting to. I'm going to get the service from that closest antenna in that natural park when I'm going to drive my smart bikes. Right? That's what we need to solve in the pragmatic way. So I mentioned 5G, and I mentioned that part of the standard of 5G is the distributed cloud by nature. And as we drive our bike or cars, smart cars, from one point to another, the user experience continuity is key. I cannot drop my service. I want to manage my floating IPs, right? Doesn't matter where I take my mobile device, and that mobile device can be a drone at some point. Uh, so we still need to care about the service. Obviously, 5G comes with endless numbers of numbers. The same cloud tenants and endpoints we used to support in our day one when we designed OpenStack, now we need to support thousands of units connected to our clouds, right? Um, so, and again, I also need to maintain the reliability, right? Everybody in the telco business know that they have five nines. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed from compliance. Nothing has changed from security. In, in fact, security is the worst one, right? Because at some point, if, if I have a, um, th there's a Chick-fil-A use case. I'm not sure if you've seen that, right? You can have an edge box in every retail end. Someone can come to your retail endpoint and take the box and leave. As they leave with the box, what have they taken with them? How do we secure the box? What actually lives on the box? All right, so that's the new questions you need to start asking yourself. And obviously, we're not going to start with tackle each one of the edge use cases. A lot of us are NAV players or enterprise players with edge uh, use case. Some of the edge customers I'm serving today are actually public sector. Um, and this is like we need to that, have that new capabilities closer and closer to the customer premise. But again, as the use case, it's not just retail, as I mentioned, it's like your home, smart homes, smart cars, and so on and so on. We already talked about the virtual reality uh, aspects and new services. So if I'm a, a, a consumer, then I really want to get the 10 times faster speed, that doesn't matter where I am, with my new device, right? I also would like to get the service not just faster, I want to get the new services. It's not just about doing things faster. It's what actually unlocks with these new capabilities. IoT is around the corner with these new capabilities. And when we look at the edge, it comes with a lot of constraints. 5G specifically, like latency, right? The distance is less than 100 kilometers. This is what we're trying to solve, right? Bandwidth is limited. The resilience, I have to make it autonomous. As I said, that box may be disconnected from the network for hours, days, weeks, and suddenly pops up again in the network. Hmm, how do I push new application uh, updates to it? Over the air updates, uh, how do I maintain the metadata, the new metadata of the images, and so on, right? Um, I, I mentioned the regulations that are not going anywhere, uh, actually enforced at the edge, and obviously I need a way to do the all day two, right? I need to do a way to do upgrade to the box, right? Uh, so nothing goes away from that requirements. One thing that I have alluded to is the scale, right? We're talking about 10 to 100 Ks of sites, and each one of them basically serving uh, um, tens of nodes, right? And I'm going to visualize this for you. So one of the things I heard in previous session we had on the working edge, people have the assumption that we're providing services from the centralized site all the way down to the far edge. And I have to correct that misunderstanding. This is not what we're trying to do. What we are trying to do is actually provide you that service, if you're in the R8 edge flock, right, I want you to get the service from the closest point of presence to you and not from R3, right, or C1 for that matter. 
So that's what we're trying to do. I need a way to deploy images, obviously, from the centralized control plane to the EDS boxes. But the service is actually much more limited. It's a smaller problem to solve, right? Um, and this is another great visualization of what I just said. I'm not trying to take that one-to-one -one ratio that we had in the original data centers and apply it all the way down. Because guess what? In the previous session, someone mentioned the I.O. I'm not going to push all that I.O. down all the way to the far edge. There's no point, right? Um, and when we talk about edge, there's basically three factors you need to bring in, right? Uh, the first one is deployment, and I mentioned all the day two. That doesn't go away. It's actually about getting more complex. How do I do upgrades and updates of that edge? Um, the form factors are not the same. As, you, as you've seen here, it's not the same edge form factor if I'm running on a provider premise where we see edge cloud central office. That can be a POC, a POP, point of presence, or if a branch office and so on. Uh, and it's not endpoint, not the same endpoint as the end service that can be like by the thousands and at some point millions of devices. Um, so the third aspect is workloads, right? Uh, we heard that we're still serving legacy and traditional workloads in our cloud. Now we need to basically construct the same workloads or at least strip them down to be able to run at the edge. And I have this news flash for you guys. They're not the same. Some of them are cloud native. Some of them will only run Kubernetes at the edge connected to our OpenStack cloud. Some of them will run bare metal only. Or, or co containers deployed on, over bare metal. They're not the same. So when we talk about the deployment, it is actually connects to the workloads. What will dictate it is the workload. If the workload is stateless, stateless then we're probably going to have a cache in that box with sometimes some of my customers talking about like half a terabyte disk. That's it. So how many images you can have cached? And that's it. But, but guess what? The workload is stateless. If the edge box is dead, it doesn't matter. Right? We have another one that provides a service. We're not trying to do DR between edge to edge. Right? Our, our distribution model is from the PO point of presence to the edge. This is a great uh, framework that the Arcano uh, Edge Stack uh, working group put together. And I really would like to adopt it into how, what we treat today also when we talk about storage. Uh, so I would argue that OpenStack from day one was doing uh, pretty much the cruiser, the large uh, pods, and tricycle, the, the medium pods. This is something that all of you guys are doing today. Nothing new today, we can handle it today. When we talk about the first edge, right, use cases we're going to solve in OpenStack, we're talking basically unicycle pod and satellite. The last thing we're going to deal with is the rover, right? This is already the, think about the customer premise, thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of devices. Um, when we talk about Ceph hyperconverged, um, where do we need storage co-located at the box, right? The stateful application that needs that capabilities, where you want co-located. Now, I'm not sure if you know, but we already containerized OpenStack, right? <laughs> uh, uh, OpenStack can be deployed as microservices today. We can already deploy Ceph containerized, so that we solve that problem. As we go to more closer to a distributed model, we need to do more of this. We need to co-locate as much as we can in a containerized fashion our deployment to solve that, right? Now, this is just a quick show of how the different use cases map to the deployment, right? So as I said, the natural core and regional core is stuff we do already today, right? Most of the public carriers, uh, public providers in North America, for example, that use OpenStack, and the majority are using OpenStack, are already doing it today. Um, what we're trying to address in the near future is what we call the distributed compute nodes. That, that's pretty much the first line we're going to do it, and it's going to tackle two of the boxes that I mentioned earlier, and that we're going to finish our talk going into the last one. Um, so as we start to talk about the storage, we have a better understanding of what the form factors, what the things we need to care, care about. I want to hand it over now to Sebastian to talk about what, what the meaning of basically of running Ceph at the edge. Thanks, Sean. So uh, now we we're going to dive into some uh, architecture considerations. Uh, as, um, as Sean mentioned, um, as we move to the edge, there are really fundamental changes that will be uh, applied on your platform. So we're going to go through uh, some examples and when it's to be considered and when it's to be done in order to properly like, deploy uh, uh, to the edge. Uh, so well, first and foremost, um, I guess it's a given now, but we really have to 
start implementing uh, hyperconverged infrastructures. Uh, so we have been talking about this for, for months and years now, and this, this has been like the real enabler for this kind of setup. So once you go to the edge, then uh, since, since the requirements are uh, really different from traditional platforms, uh, there is no such thing as uh, high, high performance, like big computation workloads or things like this. Um, so we, um, we, we, um, the, the way we deploy the storage, uh, the way we configure it, uh, will be completely different. Um, and then, um, we have to do HCI, so basically HCI consists of um, collocating compute and storage resources on the same machine. So in this particular case, since again, we don't really have any uh, big uh, performance constraints or requirements, then this gives us a better hardware utilization, which is a really nice thing to have. Uh, the, the types of the, the type of applications that we will find when you when when you go to the edge, uh, well, doesn't really require any performance again. So uh, from the VNF, from all the things like caching, this this will definitely happen on the edge. Um, but these are really low thermal services that will be running. Um, this is a little bit on the side, but um, it, it's also really handy to deploy this kind of uh, infrastructure because uh, if you want to do like a, a POC or, or pilot, then it's, um, it's, it's fairly minimal. So everything can be contained into a single box or, or in three boxes, uh, depending on how, how small you want to get. But that's also really, really convenient to get your hands on um, the environment, the service, the, the service APIs to interact with them, to configure your applications with them, and also explore the different interfaces that are available once you go with that kind of stack. Uh, you, as a reminder, we, um, in, in this particular example, we are really focusing on Ceph, and uh, Ceph, again, is a unified storage system that provides different interfaces to access your data, so that can be through um, object, block, or, or fast system. So, again, that's, uh, that's a really good way to uh, get your hands on uh, the new technologies um, if we dive a little bit into uh, what a distributed compute node actually is, uh, it's typically, this is the typical representation of uh, all the services that will be running on those uh, distributed compute nodes. So again, you will find that we have compute resources, so all of your VMs um, and, on, and the self services and the open stack services, all of them are being containerized. So um, the thing, one of the major thing that is changing from the traditional way that we deploy uh, OpenStack environments um, is that in this particular example, um, we have demands that are also being, uh, demand and the managers are also running. Uh, so if not familiar with Ceph, uh, the monitor is the brain of the cluster. Uh, the manager is responsible for gathering info and managing maps and storing them. Uh, and the OSDs are the um, object storage demons, which are responsible for basically writing, reading, and replicating, uh, healing the cluster. Uh, so um, typically, when we deploy OpenStack, we we have the demands and the managers on the control plane because they are like services that are controlling Ceph. But in this particular example, because the pod is at the edge and the control plane is uh, at a different location, then all of the Ceph cluster is being configured on that particular machine. Uh, Obviously, when you, once you have this kind of setup, again, you have a better resource utilization. Everything is a container, so um, everything is being isolated uh, through namespaces. So, and you can all, you basically get all the goodness of containers for, for performing upgrades and even rollback if necessary. So what does uh, distributed HCI look like? So this is kind of a high level diagram, uh, but, uh, but Julio will be diving uh, on, um, on a more concrete diagram uh, in a couple of slides. But typically, the, how that's going to be represented is that you have a centralized site where the control plane is running. So basically, the control plane represents all the services APIs. Uh, there is no storage being involved into this, this component. Uh, and then you have different sites, which, which represent the, uh, the edges. and these site run the HCI nodes that we just uh, discussed. So, um, yeah, this is well, basically summarizing everything I just said. Um, so one of the one of the challenges that we uh, will be facing once the, when deploying this kind of infrastructure is that um, we have to find a way to distribute cloud images uh, because again, if we if we go back to this particular slide. Uh, 
the control plane is over here, but the storage and the compute reside on this side. So uh, it's kind of a tough question because uh, even though we have the control plane that is uh, detached from the compute and storage resources, then we still want to have this ability to to have cloud images being replicated across uh, all the edges uh, and not being necessarily centralized on the control plane because remember when you boot a, when you boot a VM, then you have to, if you're far on the edge, and then you have to fetch that image, then they are things like latency, obviously, and that will be involved in, into the process, and this might take a while. So we, we had to, um, we, um, we really had to, to, to think on, um, put together right design, but it's an, it's an initial step, and, and again, Julio will be diving a little bit more into this, but this is primarily one of the biggest challenges we have at the moment, um, is to, to be able to replicate images or at least have them being available. So. Uh, at the moment, we will continue to have plants images on the control plane, and these images will basically be fetched uh, on the compute, no compute, compute storage nodes, um, which is not necessarily uh, the best thing, but um, because there are, there are so many ways you could, uh, you could implement this, but at the moment, we, they, they are, we don't really want to disrupt too much the way things are being implemented, so uh, the original design would be to have images basically being stored. Um, this is, this is, um, well, this is basically like this. Once we can get uh, glance uh, having multiple backends, so uh, once we have that, we can go further and uh, with Ceph really be able to add images, point to a particular location, which represents in this case um, uh, an edge, and tell to glance. Okay, this image is part of that uh, uh, that edge. Um, and then replicate them through another way, but I'm I'm um, I'm diverging here. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, I, I, I know this is in glance, but uh, it's it's an initial it's an initial step, and uh, as I was saying, this is um, I think it's um, the way I see it is that. I want it to be implemented for Ceph, but obviously that's not the case because we have to have it uh, in a way that is really generic. So um, not everyone is using Ceph, although I would love to see everyone be using it. Um, but at first, because the, the API is really generic, we have to implement this in a way that uh, any, back, any particular backend could consume this uh, the same way and have the, the same experience in the end. So that's a different way to put it, to put it I guess. Um, so this is um, this is a, another diagram which basically captures uh, uh, how the setup is going to to look like. So uh, again, you will have this the centralized um, place uh, where all the the OpenStack controllers are all running. Uh, well, they they typically come by by three, and then you have all the hedges, the, the remote site. Uh, and this is basically a zoom out of what I just uh, showed, where you have the VMs, the OSDs, and the mounts. Uh, and then you can have as many uh, as many pods um, pods edges uh, basically as uh, as you want. Uh, but then I would like to uh, to hand it over to Julio, who will be um, telling uh, telling us uh, how to get there. What are the new challenges uh, that we uh, will be facing? What's the state of the integration? What are the working groups and discussions that are uh, uh, currently happening? So I want to talk a bit about how uh, these concepts are translated into Tribolo and what's the current status of things and a little bit about our ideas for the future. And I would like to start from what has been discussed before in another session from the H Working Group because um, uh, we are trying to join forces obviously. And so the Edge Computing Group has a few use cases, one of which that the, um, the group mentioned it was the mobile service for uh, 5G use cases and um, came up with a diagram about the idea of how the specific use case could be implemented with, you know, with OpenStack. Uh, I would like to start from that diagram and also maybe compare with it and see how Dribbolo is approaching the same issue. And I will also use, or at least I will try to use the same terminology which is in the Edge Working Group diagram, even though I'm probably more familiar with the Dribbolo terminology, but let's see. So this was the uh, diagram that was proposed like at the um, 
previous PTG, and it's uh, split mainly in three layers, uh, basing mostly on the scaling factor. So there's the, there are expectations that on the far edge sides you might have like something like a hundred different deployments. Uh, in this, what what's defined as the edge side, you might have something like ten deployments, and all of them are federated mainly because of the authentication and because of the images in one main data center. Um, trying to match that with what is happening in Dribbble, uh, we should be um, implementing something that for the edge sites looks very much like the existing Dribbble controller. So that's where all the OpenStack services and API are deployed. And we should be implementing uh, another, let's say, set of roles, uh, which are defining what the Far Edge site is. And this looks a lot like a triple O compute node plus what has been discussed by Sebastian, storage, persistent storage, which eventually with Ceph means collocating compute and Ceph. So we would be implementing more or less something like this. Uh, so in the Far Edge site, we would have Nova Compute, Neutron Agents, Glance API, Caching, and Cinder Volume, and all the Ceph services. Obviously, we're talking about mm, deploying in containers eventually across a relatively small set of nodes, like let's say three. Uh, and in the Edge site, which is where all the OpenStack services are, we would have the entire set of the APIs, schedulers, database, yeah, and orchestration like heat. Um, I want to look a bit more at how we are approaching the storage issues because this is focused on how we are using Ceph and the, uh, how, how HCI is beneficial in this scenario. So there is, a, um, there is mainly two issues. One is with the persistent storage, so Cinder, and the other one is with images. And for Cinder, um, we opted for going active-active in the edge site, so you might have like three instances running at the same time, uh, which is something that relies a lot on a correct implementation of the backend driver for Cinder, and we kind of committed on making Ceph one of the drivers that, you know, RBD, I should say, one of the drivers that initially is tested and behaves correctly in active-active configuration. This was extremely useful to avoid pushing the need for pacemaker in the far edge site, which we really didn't want to because of the additional hardware requirements. Um, we also, have, well, we will probably work on a set of custom rules in Triple O to make sure that, you know, if you have 10 compute nodes in one of the far edge sites, which is eventually not that small, you don't really need to scale Cinder volume on all 10 of them or the Ceph monitors on all 10 of them. So there will be probably at least a couple of rules uh, while for the uh, Farage side, I would like to point out that the way how we are grouping together resources is that Ceph, uh, which will be an isolated Ceph cluster in every far edge site, is going to be, uh, I would say, uh, the locality with the Nova nodes and the Cinder nodes is mainly given by the use of availability zones and not regions. So in the control plane, you will see different availability zones for each far edge site. Uh, and um, because of how it is implemented in Dribbble, you will be able to scale independently the central site from each and every far edge site. So there are no changes to the far edge site, not even in the number of nodes that require changes in either the control plane or the other far edge sites. Um, for image, uh, things are a bit more complicated. That's something that Sebastian was approaching earlier. So ideally for a backend like Ceph, you would like to use a uh, yeah, mechanism that allow you to deduplicate data and not really copy the same image over to every edge site, which um, we're approaching with RBD mirroring, but let's say the triple is not there yet, at least not for the stain cycle. So what we will see in the stain cycle is more like glands using caches locally, so that every image which every far edge site, every far edge site needs will be initially pulled over from the central site, but then will stay in a local cache, so closer to the actual compute nodes. This is also to, um, because it plays well with two um, interesting uh, challenges. One is, on, on one hand, we want all the images that are in the central site available to the far edge sites, but we don't really want to replicate them all because we don't have as much storage. 
And the other issue is we, um, uh, let's say that the um, local cache is currently well supported in Dribbble, so like we could get it done uh, relatively quickly and get it actually working in Stain while using multiple backends that Erno previously was pointing out, it's uh, too much for Stein, let's, let's put it that way. So it's a building block, what we are putting in place now with caching is a building block, we obviously want to get it better, uh, it's just not happening in this release. And this is a diagram, um, this is similar to what Sebastian was showing, it's just a little bit more detailed about how the services are distributed. Um, and uh, so what you have at the top is the ideal deployment of our control plane together with the undercloud. This is not very different from what Tribolo <coughs> does already today, except there are not compute nodes. And there can optional be a Ceph cluster if you use it for other reasons, but and the, yeah, again, it's not necessary. While in each and every remote site, we will have a Ceph cluster, some compute nodes, Cinder working active, active, and Glance cache, Glance caching active. I, um, well, if you have questions, I'm happy to discuss this later, after the session. Um, a zoom on the issue that we have with the images is that um, currently the, the, the previous diagram would uh, require Glance to pull the image on each uh, for each site when the image is needed the first time. <coughs> Uh, some people asked why we are not like pre-populating the glance cache. This is a bit like going back to the same issue of we don't have enough storage or we don't necessarily use all images in all far edge sites. So yes, pre-populating would help because on initial deployment you would already have the image locally available but it has some drawbacks. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> This is how your uh, forage site would look like. And I would like to hand it over to Sean again to discuss a bit more what is happening in the future. And Thanks, Julio. So we saw a lot of movement, I promised you, right? This is like a complicated uh, problem to solve, but we're getting there and we're getting there step by step. And you can actually help us. Uh, so I want to start talking about the near term roadmap as well as the long term consideration. So, some of the workloads of our temporally edge forage disconnects. I mentioned that earlier, right? Some of the use cases, that box may be disconnected from the net for hours, days, weeks, suddenly pops up. How do we push the updates to it? Uh, Julio pushed around like initial, right? We need to get all of this cached images there for the begin with populated. So that's an initial, like the chicken and the egg problem, how we bootstrap that. Uh, uh, the working edge uh, group is focusing on that aspect as well. but. Some of the cases we've seen, because of the workloads are completely stateless in some of the cases of the edge, the far edge is like, we don't have a storage requirement, right? as I mentioned. So it's just purely a compute node, maybe running a one uh, a containerized workload uh, um, at the edge, or bare metal, as I said. Um, Happy can verge with Ceph monitors uh, uh, using container resource allocations, right? The, the, we have a whole resource management that we solve with HCI in the main center, right? Because it's always going to be with HCI, you, you're fighting in memory, you're fighting CPU, right? So we still need to deal with it, but in a different way. So that's something that we will we'll continue to look at. And we need the ability to deploy multiple Ceph clusters with people. This is what have you seen that we're working already in the same release. Um, and finally, the, the cache, which is how we deploy it by default, right? Today, if you deploy Glance, the cache is not even enabled by default, right? That's you, as we go and deploy edge roles, and we have a new role, and by the way, in the previous session of the work, edge working group, people, someone asked, when are we gonna have like a stripped down version of OpenStack, running only the services we need? I have a news item for you. That's what we're doing, right? Have you seen on the edge side, only that specific services that needs to be there, are gonna be there. We don't need the full blown uh, 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 cloud at the edge. Um, and finally, the glance image synchronization and replication mechanism, that's pretty much this diagram. We need to improve that way because that's gonna be key for our workload delivery. At the end of the day, it's all about the workload, all about the workload, how we can refresh that new workload, metadata, and so on at the edge sites. Um, so 
if I started earlier and showed you where we focus in at, and, and the distributed HCI initial focus is at the unicycle, pod, and satellite, as we go deeper, we are going to address also the right side, which is the rover, right? This is the, think about the end remote side closest to the customer premises. We, but in order to get there, we need to go step by step, uh, right? And going back to what I said earlier about the last one, right now we this distributed compute node model that Sebastian have showed, we, we focus on, this is we're solving the satellite, we're solving the unicycle footprints, but we also want to start dealing with the distributed rover, right? Um, that can be deployed by the thousands and, and so on. And the objective is multiple standalone server deployed from a single location, right? Connected to a centralized size on demand and resynchronize the metadata, right? Uh, this can be a standalone server, maybe just one box, right? Let's put it on the table. Uh, with uh, compute, sometimes with storage or without, not all of the workloads re required like uh, stateless, stateful and, and uh, state. And obviously the limitations. AJ is a consideration, but in some cases, the way we're going to design the edge services, I really don't care if that single box that dies, right? Because I have other ones to take care of the service. The key point, what I said ever earlier, when I showed you the goal of edge, I want to maintain, as I move with my mobile device, maintain the service. The experience should be what I care about, right? And that's what we're trying to achieve with every one of these footprints. So, to summarize, OpenStack at the edge, we have more than one deployment. It's not one edge that we care about. And obviously, we already figured out to deploy large clusters. We've been doing it quite successfully over the years. Now we're looking at close edge, distributed node, and finally we're going to get to the standalone use cases, which is like one box, right? And I can tell you that our ecosystem uh, 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 pro pro hardware providers are actually building bo new boxes now. So don't think about your regular pizza boxes one new service anymore. There are not, it, we're going to talk about strip down OpenStack, strip down hardware as well for that use cases. So that overall transformation is happening now, and the good news, you can take, be part of it, right? right that's the key takeaways. We're taking gradual steps. It's the first step we, we, we're taking, but it's happening now. Um, so if you want to join us, uh, the Edge Working Group is where. We have IRC, obviously channel, mailing is, and so on. Uh, you can follow up us at any one of the specs that we just touched upon today. This is not science fiction. We're actually working on this. And the good news, we started this already at the Stain PTG, the uh, uh, gathering, and the EFA pads are amazing. So I, I, the reason I put it there, because you see, you hear all the voices in the room, and it's, they're not still consistent. But what's going to happen if every PTG we're going to go forward, we're going to get consolidation, and we're going to get prioritization, what we can do next, right? And that's what it's all about. And I want to take the opportunity to thank you for coming and open the bar uh, for questions. Uh, and I want to invite again my two Distinguished colleagues, Julian, Sebastian. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us today. Thanks All right, for please use the microphone if you have any questions. I think we have like five minutes. Or? Yeah, five minutes. Yeah. So in your last slide, you had um, two control planes, the main cloud. Yeah, so you had a control plane in uh, site A and in site B. Is there a plan for synchronization uh, or are those sites always going to be um, monolithic. So I have another slide in the, my backup slide, but I took it off specifically that deals exactly with that. One of the use cases we have is a centralized component with two component planes, right? Uh, um, the reason I didn't put it intentionally, we're not there yet, right? So there's a, we, we still have to solve the initial use cases before we go deeper to the, because it's a different set of problems. But it doesn't mean we don't uh, think about it, right? The, the point I was making about the edge, the PTG, we list all the requirements there, but we need to start somewhere. This is, I, I would call, the advanced use case already. But it's not something we prioritize to start with. Yeah. No, I, I agree with your roadmap. Start small and work out. It's good. Thank you. Any additional questions? Well, uh, I saw that you have uh, some uh, sites where you don't... Uh, where you don't have control plane. My question is, how do you handle uh, with, uh, for, for example, Rabbit MQ connectivity when you have latency issues on your network? How does it work? Yeah, so it doesn't. The existing workload remains up because it's not affected by disconnects. But yeah, the cloud is not 
overable, I'd say. You cannot really go and create new workload on a cloud which is disconnected anyway. So, yeah, that's how it seems. It doesn't work. <laughs> the workload which is already there remains active. Yes, there is nothing impeding the local Ceph cluster to, you know, deliver the service or compute nodes to stay, to keep the guests up. So the existing workload remains active, but the five yeah, side remains. In that case, probably you should have a rabbit for each site, or you didn't consider that. Right. So there are many different. Uh, we would have a similar problem with the database as well. Uh, we could have a similar problem with the scaler. There are there are. Let's say there are pros and cons to every different solution. And one of the requirements that we had that we really wanted to, you know, be, um, not need to deploy PaceMaker in the fire site. So for the database, that would be impossible. Uh, for Rabbit, probably is more reasonable because it doesn't really need PaceMaker, but still adds load on an, on a node or a relatively small set of nodes, which in theory is just delivering a service. So. But yes, uh, we could we could we could play with it, and my take is uh, Trivolo is very good at that. Like you have a very flexible way of customize your roles and distribute services differently, and so this is actually relatively easy to try with with Trivolo in particular. Okay, thanks. Last question. Yeah, hi. Uh, is there any intention to reuse the image cache uh, or part of the image cache code for Nova into the, the caching that you want to plan in, in Glass? Yeah, some think, part of that. I think this is, this is definitely what we want to improve uh, because currently we're not, we're, not anymore to, we're not able anymore to take advantage of uh, the copy and write clonings from SAP because the, all the caches, uh, the cached images are again files in the file system where we, we got rid of that, but the initial implementation has just flat files, so then each time you boot a VM, you will, they, they will all be backed by this particular file, which is not ideal, and the goal later is to, once we fetch the image, just directly put it into Ceph, so once you boot your VMs, then that's yeah. way faster. Yeah. 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 That's, uh, yeah, so we would like to take the benefits of good Ceph, question. obviously, uh, when we can, but again, there's like, uh, 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 things we need to do first. Um, so we would like to thank you again for coming. Uh, we're available here and you can follow up on Twitter and uh, feel free to join our discussion in the working group and so on. And uh, have a great summit. Thank, thank you. you.